All right, what's going on? Welcome to New York City. I'm Bill Ryder. This show is Ryder's Block, and we got a great show planned for you today. Washington head coach Mike Hopkins is going to be on the program. Really good dude. There's some movement in the NFL. We'll go inside the numbers of some of the biggest names. And we all know Antonio Brown is a Raider. Kicks us off from New York City starting right now. Thursday as a Raider, baby. Woo! Woo! First day as a Raider, baby. Hey, celebrate with me and my family right now. We at my crib. We just celebrating the first day as a Raider. God, I love you guys, Raider Nation. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hey, man, you could be mad at AB, but it's not a bad day to be Antonio Brown. And if you have a you know, buddy who's a Steelers fan, you can send him that with a smirk. The deal is done, and he's a very happy-looking man. He looks good in a Raiders cap, too. Maybe those two things add up because beyond whether you thought it was appropriate or not, that he w didn't want to play at the Steelers, whatever went down with Buffalo, the reality is that Antonio Brown, a lot like an NBA player, though that shouldn't be possible in the NFL, won the moment, took on the Steelers, and, and didn't just win, utterly dominated. Here's some facts about his new contract. New deal, $54.1 million over the next three years. The big number, a little more than $30 million guaranteed, making the highest paid wide receiver in the league. The old deal, the one with the Steelers, the one he forced his way out of, just $39 million, none of it guaranteed. So first and foremost, whatever happens on the field in the days and years ahead, this is a huge victory for Antonio Brown. And here's a refresher on why it happened this way, on why the Raiders did what they did, and they didn't give up much, and why Antonio Brown, for all the histrionics, for all the diva nature, for giving up on his team, is probably worth the risk if you're John Gruden or another organization that needs a turnaround. Antonio Brown, one of the absolute most dominant players on the field the last few years. We walked through it the other day. Since 2013, leads the league in almost every receiving category on earth. The dude is shortly, frankly, candidly, an absolute stud. And, and again, the Raiders paid a very small price. Not a first round pick, not a second round pick, a third and a fifth rounder for a guy that could be a game changer. Maybe in ways that are bad in the locker room, but certainly possibly in ways on the field. It also adds up to the fact, and we'll get to what it means to the Raiders in a second, the Steelers lose. This is an abomination of a front office management move. You have to get more for Antonio Brown. You have to than a third and a fifth round pick. And I've been at the forefront of the John Gruden criticism on this show, on the national radio show that I host on CBS Sports Radio. And certainly it felt reinforced the idea that John Gruden and his $100 million contract didn't know what he was doing. But this could be his redemption. It's possible. First and foremost, it's one player. And our own sports lines prediction, you can see this here, show a small but marked bump for this organization. That's one guy taking their playoff chances to almost three times higher. And remember, Gruden and the Raiders have a lot more moves that they can make. They've got three first round picks, an early second round pick. There's the possibility of Le'Veon Bell. He's in the mix. He's rumored to be a guy that could also be ended up in Oakland, soon to be Las Vegas. And I know I'm a doubter too, because last year's Raiders moves felt pretty abysmal, but you see the consequences there. They brought in a lot of guys. That's the consequence. That's the price. That's what you get for giving away Khalil Mack to my Bears, which we appreciate it. Amari Cooper went to Dallas for a high price too and played really well for the Cowboys. Yet all of a sudden it feels like maybe Chucky, maybe John Gruden, maybe the formerly young coaching guru who's a little bit older knows what he's doing. And the last laugh will be on me and other doubters. We'll see. Antonio Brown's a high leverage situation. Le'Veon Bell would be the exact same thing. Trent Brown's about to be one of the highest paid players at his position very, very soon. And remember, those three first round picks are significant for the Raiders, not the least of which is because they have the number four overall pick and reportedly Gruden is in love with, infatuated with Kyler Murray. Could they go up and get the number one pick? Could they call Arizona and say the obvious, you already have Josh Rosen from last year, we'll give you a bevy of opportunities in the draft. Let us have our quarterback of the future. Kyler Murray, plus Antonio Brown, plus Le'Veon Bell. I mean, it could be an absolute disaster. It could be a train wreck. It could be a joke, or maybe 
just maybe John Gruden knows what he's doing and the hundred million dollars he's collecting, the joke of that contract won't be on the Raiders, but on the rest of us who doubted him. It's certainly going to be interesting to see. And we have a new paradigm in the NFL. And this is true for Aaron Donald. This was true for Cleo Mack when he held out, but Antonio Brown in the biggest way, NFL players under contract are making the kind of demands and having the kind of leverage, at least until recently, we thought belonged almost exclusively to the NBA. So whatever happens for the Raiders, however big of a loss it is for the Steelers, I think it's significant. We know this today. The biggest winner in this entire thing is A.B., and as you saw there, a very, very happy man. Mike Hopkins is a happy man, switching to a different sport. He is the head coach at Washington, and he is about to lead his team to the first berth in the NCAA tournament in his head coaching career. was behind Jim Beheim for a long time in Syracuse as an assistant. We're going to visit with him about Washington, about this team, about the importance of seniors, and about a host of other things when we come back to the program. Riders Block with me, Bill Ryder, here on CBS Sports HQ. All right, welcome back into New York City. Bill Ryder with you here on Riders Block on CBS Sports HQ. You know it's March. I know it's March, which means we are spending a lot of our focus on college hoops, and it's a thrill to be joined by the men's head basketball coach from Washington, the University of Washington, Coach Mike Hopkins. Coach, thanks for congratulations on a successful season so far, and thank you for being here. I love being here. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate you. So you guys have four seniors who have been major contributors to your team and what you guys are about. As a coach, what are the advantages to having that kind of experience in an age where we still talk a lot about one-and-done guys? Well, I think it means a lot. I mean, in reality, we've only really they're, – they're seniors in years, but they're, we've coached them for about 18 months. And, uh, but when you have experience and you have guys that really believe in each other like they do, uh, they've played a lot of minutes, it, it makes it a huge advantage – especially with what we've been trying to build here. Uh, you got one of the best defensive players in the, in the country, and you've got one of the best scorers in the country. So it's been a huge advantage. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to go into a, a new program, any place, any business, whether it's basketball or something else, and try to change the culture and make your imprint quickly. Obviously, you've done that. As you look back at your short time there, what would you attribute your success to in terms of getting your guys and your team to play your style of basketball? I think the greatest thing is I got a great staff. And uh, when we came in, none of us have ever worked uh, with each other and, you know, trying to build the culture and then get them to understand how we want to have the zone and how we're going to play offense. And then the time spent trying to build that on a day to day basis. You know, you're never thinking about wins and losses. You're just trying to figure out how can we get our systems in and then how can we build a strong culture. And uh, there's been a lot of ups and downs, but. When the kids started getting it and started to believe in our message, that's when we started seeing it go on the, on the uphill swing. So I, I, I'd attribute that a lot to my staff. You know, I, I read a great story. I think it was in the Seattle Times recently about that very thing and some of your assistants and their, your relationship with them and then that impact. We talk a lot about teammates needing to find a way to trust each other and work together. Can you give us some insight on what <laughs> goes into trying to get a coaching staff to do the same thing behind the scenes? I think like in anything, uh, you know, values have to align. And I've got not only great coaches, I've got great people, great family men. And, uh, you know, when they're all, you know, their vision and their values are on winning and helping kids develop, it makes it really, really easy. And when you're trying to get a team to buy in, the most important thing is that they see that the coaches buy in. And we spend a lot of time together. It's like four buddies going out there and trying to do something special and great, and try to develop these kids. And, on and off the court. It's been a lot of fun and uh, it's been a big key to our success. And certainly trying to build trust, having a resume, having some street cred, it doesn't hurt. You were an assistant for a long time at Syracuse. We all know who the head coach is there. Jim Beheim is a legend in this business. You were there for, for two decades. What were the things you learned from Coach Beheim? What was the way that he shaped you in practical terms for the job that you're doing now? Gosh, so many things. Uh, you know, I. So many times when I'm trying to make a decision on, you know, it could be in the game, it could be outside. There's so many things that I go back to reference. And uh, the one thing I always remember being on the road and we're playing in a game and he used to always say to win on the road, you got to be able to keep scoring. you got to keep scoring. <laughs> so, you know, I'll make substitutions based on that. Um, 
but so many great stories that I always reference. But the key to his success is the simplicity in his messaging. He's a great communicator. He gets them to understand what it takes to win. And uh, I think we've been able to do that here. We've been able to have a simplematic approach, simplify it, make it simple, get these guys to buy in. And uh, it's one of the most uh, successful, consistent winning styles in the history of college basketball. And I was lucky to learn from him. Yeah, it's not sexy, but but culture in all sports and all endeavors really <laughs> it's is sexy. everything. Come on. Is it? All right. Let we're coach, we're gonna Winning make it sexy. sexy. Culture yes, is sexy. Winning is sexy. <laughs> Winning winning is sexy. It also helps to have some great players. You've mentioned several, but because we're looking at March, we're also looking at Naismith Player of the Year conversations, and Matisse Thibel for you guys has been an absolute machine. For folks who haven't seen Matisse play very much, can you make the case for him? Maybe to folks who don't pay enough attention to West Coast basketball because of the time change out east, what this young man is about and what he's meant to your program. He's one of the highest character kids uh, that I've ever been around, and not only that, he's, he's an incredible basketball player, but He's got a, a God-given ability on the defensive end. He's got great anticipation. He's got uh, great athleticism and length. And then on top of that, he just he's a savant the way that he reads it on the defensive end, from blocking shots to stealing the ball. He's the ultimate disruptor. And uh, when you're playing defense, uh, people try to play around him. They try to screen him. They try to avoid him. And uh, He's been kind of the head of the snake for our defense, and it's been a huge advantage for us. Now it's getting in the heads of everybody that we play. Your leading scorer, Jalen, he's a sophomore, and we knew he was a good player last year. He's also been a lot more efficient this season. Is that just the natural progression from one season to the next, or is it something that you and your staff worked on with him to try to be more efficient as part of his offense? Well, I think the for us to get better from last year, it was, you know, guys had to help each other on the offensive end. And Jalen has the, you know, he's an alpha scorer, but his ability to get in the lane and make plays is always good for our team. But can he make others around him better? And in league, he let us in assists. Uh, he played some backup point. And, uh, you know, when, when we're sharing the ball, we're really, really a different offense. And it always starts with him. And so uh, not only his ability to make big shots and his, percentages of boom, but him making others around him better is what we try to get him to focus on. All right, there's no doubt that your team, your program's had a great season. You guys are dangerous. And I like the, I love the Pac-12. I lived out west for a while, but it has been a down year for the Pac-12. Certainly the perception is that barring someone else other than you guys winning the Pac-12 tournament, it might just be Washington that goes from that conference. Is that a fair reading of the conference, or are there some teams there, some excellence there that you think – hasn't been appreciated by folks maybe not out west. I, you know, I don't think it gets, uh, you know, it, it goes back to, you know, you winning in the non-conference. But teams get a lot of injuries. Teams get a lot of injuries. And a lot of guys, uh, you know, you look at Oregon. I mean, they're such a high-quality team. You know, earlier they had, uh, you know, Bull Bull. He got injured. Now they've got Lewis King. A very, very tough team. I think Oregon State is, a you know, a high-quality team. Arizona State has been kind of the – uh, the non-conference darling for us, uh, but I'm, I'm a big believer. They got great coaches, great traditions, great programs, and uh, you know I've been in the Big East and the ACC. This is this has got a lot of great potential, a lot of great young talent, and the, you know it's just going to keep moving onward. Yeah, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the, the situation, there is obviously talent in that conference. What's the challenge for you to make sure that your guys don't look past the conference tournament? Given, you know, if you're young, the ability to look at some of your opponents and say, we, we got this, no, no big deal. Well, I think, uh, you know, you just try to keep them, uh, I would say, humble, hungry, and wise. You just got to focus on how you can get better today. And, uh, you know, we just came after a loss. And, you know, how are we going to respond? And, you know, what are the key ingredients that we have to do to, to play our best? And, uh, you know, there's uh, so many ups and downs, so many ebbs and flows in the season that, you know, we just try to focus one game at a time. Uh, this is what we have to do to win. This is how we have to work today. And uh, if we can do that, the score will take care of itself. Coach, the net writing is going to have an impact on where people are seated and who gets in. It got a lot of grief early on because there was no previous sample size and as more data is fed into it, theoretically it should get more and more accurate. It feels like that's happened. How much have you as a head coach and your staff kept an eye on that net rating for you guys and your program throughout the season? I think you always do. I mean, you always look at, you know, the, the ultimate goal for each one of these programs in the country is to get the chance to play for a national championship. And the only way you can do that is to get into the tournament. So you want to know it, you want to study it, you want to look in, inside and out. And 
you know, you look back at our the way that we kind of, you know, went at this season, we felt it was really important to play a great non-conference schedule. I mean, you're playing three top 15 teams, two on the road, one neutral was one. I think we were the only team to do that. Uh, so we really try to challenge ourselves uh, to get the respect and then to go into conference. We, we helped. We thought that that tough scheduling would help that. And it really did, and it helped our net ranking. And, uh, you know, we were able to win 15 games, and, you know, not a lot of teams win 15 games in the league. So I think that scheduling part of what the, the net, you know, this, the, the, the difficult schedule playing tough teams really helped us. Helped us not only in terms of the numbers, but it helped us get better as a team. All right, Coach, last question for you. I love it. You've established that culture is sexy. I'm going to take that. I'm going to run with it here on Riders Block because <laughs> winning is sexy. And this will be the first time for you in your head coaching career when March yeah. Madness rolls around, your team's going to be part of it. I know there's a goal. That's the beginning of the goal, not the end. But when that moment does happen, when your team's name is called, what's that going to feel like for you as it relates to that part of your experience in this business? Well, I think when you're trying to build a, a culture and a program, it's always that experience, having the opportunity to, 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 to see what it feels like. I always remember uh, as a player walking into the Big East uh, uh, tournament, and you heard about it, you watched it as a kid, and you walk in there and you feel it. That's pretty special. Being a head coach, feeling this arena against, uh, against uh, Arizona last year and seeing what it felt like. And for our players to go and you, you feel it, the, the upperclassmen obviously will be gone, but for the younger guys to see this is the goal, this is where you want to be, uh, I think that's a really special moment for anybody to have that opportunity to do that. And, uh, you know, God willing, we get a chance to, to prove ourselves and to play on a national stage. Coach, really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for the time. Culture is sexy. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Good luck uh, the rest of the way. Go dogs. Thank you to Coach Mike Hopkins and the University of Washington for making time for us. It's a really good basketball team. We really appreciate their time. We've got great guests coming down the line every single day of the rest of the week. And next, next week, as we build up to March Madness, which of course you can catch on CBS. Appreciate you very much. We've got you covered now from Fort Lauderdale, kind of what's trending in the world of sports. Sports line coming up 30 minutes from now. Hopefully to try to make a little you-know-what if you, like me, are inclined to occasionally bet on games of chance in sports. Thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. My name is Bill Ryder. This is Ryder's Block.